Hello, everyone. I'll give you a moment to connect to sound. Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1018th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe Stagaman, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I have the extreme pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Rafael Yablanca and Fong Bui. And now I'll introduce today's guest and host. Born in Kolo, Poland in 1952, Rafael Yablanca emigrated to Germany in 1975 and studied art history at University Bochum. He opened Yablanca Gallery in 1988 in Cologne. Until 2017, the gallery showed contemporary artists, including Mike Kelly, Katarina Fritsch, Richard Prince, Francesco Clemente, and many, many others. Yablanka established Bom Chapel in 2010, an exhibition space dedicated to contemporary art. Yablanka's collection was first presented in 2008 at the National Museum in Krakow, and more recently in 2020 to 2021 at the Albertina Museum in Vienna. And our host today, artist, writer, and independent curator Fong Bui, is publisher and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects, among many other awards, Bowie received the Dorothea and Leo Rabkin Prize for Arts Writers in 2017, was the recipient of an honorary doctorate from University of the Arts in 2020, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Distinguished Service to the Arts in 2021. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Fong to get us started. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of you for joining our today's NSE, what's number I forgot now is definitely over a thousand. <laughs> we have done that many already, and it will book forever from here to eternity. Anyway, I I should begin first of all with a confession that the series aesthetic confessions, like our journal, the Brooklyn Rail, like our new social environment lunchtime conversation, which you are now. And everything else that we've been doing since October 2000, it's really all of them grew out of our desire to acknowledge the, a broader aspiration for how democratic impulse, what is known as participatory democracy, I love that term from John Dewey, had its own roots in Alexis de Tocqueville, admiration for America as an exciting experimentation of democracy in two of his essential volumes, Democracy in America. The first volume was published in 1835, second, 1840. It was his idea of, say, self-interest rightly understood, or the art of association, which I read coin it as the art of joining, which goes together in recognizing what he saw at the time how Americans were so invested, so excited, interested in joining together, supporting each other with the concept that's only when we all join together in association, benefiting the community, commonwealth, and well-being, will it in return benefit each of us individually, definitely. Can you imagine Jacksonian America of 1830s without the emergence of the transcendentalist tradition. With Thoreau, with Emerson, with Margaret Fuller, and other contributors to that beloved journal, The Dial Magazine. Imagine post-Civil War from May 1865 without Uncle Walt Whitman and the essential rise of pragmatism. I mean, the shared vision of highly intimate and personal awareness of how endless proposal of cultural and material relationship can be constantly mediated so that they can be both prophetic and redemptive at the same time. So as we experience our current Trumpian America of 2020s with his aggressive mandate of amplifying social distancing among other means to generate chaos and anxiety, we at the rail swiftly counter it by our own making of social intimacy, like us now coming together as a multiple adaptation, I would say, of how we can share our love 
and commitment through the growth of culture while nurturing the freedom of expression. That's a core principle here. That is to say, in the context of our art community, we are learning how to see it as a larger ecosystem from which everyone has a role to perform, to play. The artists make works of art. The dealers provide the space to sell and sell them. The collectors purchase them. The curators, the art historians, the art critics, writers, so on, are in their own various roles, creating contacts from historical to contemporary framing, through exhibition, through books, essay, reviews, then finally, the unpredictability, the kind of pleasure bestowed among general viewers from their viewing experiences in encountering works of art and so on. I should lastly say that the title of this series took after the legendary Danielle Henri Canvailer second memoir called Aesthetic Confection, which I hold my hand. It was written, published in 1963 by Gallimard, right after his first, or the first memoir called My Galleries and Painter, Mes Galeries et Parc. So both books, in a way, reflect his twofold status as a witness and the creator of a new mode of working with artists. At any rate, in reading the lengthy interview you have, Raphael, uh, with Axel Ruoff, an amazing lengthy 16 plus thousand words interview, there's endless epiphanies that occur throughout your life, which seem to me dictate how you live your life accordingly. So without being redundant, <laughs> I would not the same too many questions already been asked, but still, I love to ask a few, just because everyone's here to listen to you, in regard to uh, how early history, before we say, um, you know, very beginning, before we see the slide, which gonna dictate how our, our conversation gonna be, but please just be patient and answer a few fundamental questions. For example, you were born in 1952, a year after the death of Joseph Stalin, it's important to say that, <laughs> uh, for both of us who grew up in political oppressive regime in Czechoslovakia, uh, Czechoslovakia, the small city of Southern Poland, known for its Black Madonna. So what sort of family did you come from? And what was it like growing under communism in mid 1950s, leading to the decade of the 60s? what was called Polish October or Gamuka's Thaw of 1956 before you went to college at University of Krakow to study engineering, civil engineering. Rafael? No, so I start with Black Madonna because believe it or not, my uh, the house of, or, or apartment of where my family lived, I was a child, were two houses away from the monastery of Black Madonna. And mm -hmm. since we are Catholic, uh, every Sunday, uh, we went to the chapel where Black Madonna was the altarpiece. So that's where my Sundays were. So I was every Sunday confronted with the Black Madonna. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about communists, my early memories is when 1956, Bierut, which was sort of Polish Stalin, died. The, the sirens in the city of Częstochowa were running. Mm. And we, as children, I was four, had to hold hands and walk in the circle because our beloved, uh, in, in parenthesis, uh, beloved father of communists died. So that was my early political experience. Okay, were you aware what was then also the Hungarian revolution of the same year, 56? Then only I was four, so it was like 
listening to my father, listening to the radio. There was also similar pricing in Poznan. Yeah. Where, uh, where um, after that, Gomulka took over the power for a very short period of some kind of spring, which was quickly finished. And so we, listening to the news, I had the feeling that uh, there's insecurity in the world. That was the, my my memories. Yeah. Uh, so you came to Germany when you were 19, Raphael, uh, in 1971. And were you aware of the cultural intelligentsia or resistance in, in the 60s, the 70s? Because there were a lot of interesting uh, artists and filmmakers and um, all kind of poets for sure. I mean, Zamboska and then Andrei Vada and then there's Tadus Kanter and others. You're talking about Poland? I mean, yeah. 71 was short period uh, in East Germany, which was, uh, which I went because my father had connections for like, to learn a little bit language and make a summer job. That was, uh, I went to West Germany only uh, uh, 19, first time 1973. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, remember, I was an engineering student. So uh, unusual for a, such a student was that I was going to cantor spectacles. So that's or, or jazz concert. My, colleagues, the regular colleagues in the, uh, in the university didn't do that. Uh, I was, there was a little group of people interested in jazz music or uh, uh, not really art, there was not a great art, but less, uh, like Kanto who was visual artist, but he was more interesting as a theater maker. And there were other right. the experimental theaters in Krakow with like Theater 38, for example. But, you know, because of my background, I didn't really know much about modern poetry. So the mm -hmm. first time I, I, somebody, I knew the name, by the first time I read or listened to Polish modern poetry was in German. Uh -huh. was in that was the first time I, 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 I hear Oh, there is something I should be proud of. There is a Polish poetry. Mm -hmm. I knew of the classics from the school, mm -hmm. but not Szyborska, not uh, Zagajewski, not uh, uh, Zbigniew Herbert. All these were first known to me through German friends. Well, I mean, some of them wrote in German. I mean, decisively so. I mean, you take even a Czech writer like Kafka, I mean, he didn't write in Czech, he wrote in German. Because... Czech was like, at the time when Kafka was living in Prague, Czech yeah. was kind of street language. The language there was German. Like in the, that was the, Nabokov also was easy with Russian, of course, but, uh, but, but the language at the time in aristocratic language in, in Russia was French. Yeah, the language of uh, the, 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 the street language or whatever it was, was the mother language. Yeah. So aristocracy spoke French. Or... Even when you read Budenbrooks uh, by Thomas Mann, you yeah. realize how the high intelligentsia was closely related to French culture. That's, that's before... Uh, 19, what's that, 1871, when Bismarck uh, sort of made it one country. But, it's so uh, true. It's so true, Raphael. So would it be fair to say that your deep interest in jazz, in poetry, and theater came before your exposure to art? Well, it's uh, on the... Absolutely, I absolutely, absolutely. It was like nineteen, believe it or not, nineteen seventy one in Warsaw. There was a jazz festival called Jazz Jamboree, and not, knowing nothing about jazz, I was in live concert of Duke Ellington, 
Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Ornette Coleman with Charlie Hayden and, and other also famous Polish musicians like Thomas Stanko. That was somebody who is 196, uh, that was 71, who is 19 years old and, and has nothing to do with, uh, with jazz and suddenly jumps in on the highest level. This was uh, curious how it happened. It's a miracle in a way. I could yeah. Have yeah. So, so how does that lead to your first experience? In other words, what was your first experience of art that really altered your life? Was it immediate or gradual in in realizing it that it would be your lifelong? Look, I was in Munich working working as a young engineer. Yeah. Uh, and, and I and then so after the job, I in the evenings I went to jazz clubs, to listen to music, and when you finish at four o'clock from from uh, coming from jazz concerts or jazz jam sessions, yeah, it's tough to go to work as an engineer at seven o'clock. <laughs> so you so I was just a young boy looking for solution out of it. I realized. The, the jazz, which I didn't understand really, but attracted me, is more important for me than my job. So the way I was looking, what I could do. Mm -hmm. and in one of the one of the jazz clubs, I met an English woman who said, "Well, let's go to an exhibition." She was teaching art in the high school. She was uh, just teaching, and she took me to an exhibition, and I thought. That's interesting. Maybe I could, uh, I asked her, can you make money out of making exhibitions? And she said, yeah, this girl is doing money. So, so that was the initial moment. She, I, I thought this could be a good solution. I just do exhibitions. Amazing. Wow. I, and and I, I tell you, I didn't know nothing about the art. Of course, I knew Picasso, Raphael, and, and Dali. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew, I mean, I knew the name. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it's it, you can learn fast. I love what what you say in that same interview with Rolf that you re reject any kind of ideology. Uh, in other words, the same is applied in art, be it label or conceptual art, minimalism, neo expressionism, neo geo, and so on. You believe in the world of art and culture. Art is like poets, musician, dancer, and filmmaker, and so on art to have their own individual goal views, you know, individual manifestation, existing side by side, often incomparable with each other, but you appreciate seeing, for example, a Pollock next to a Balthus, a, you know, David La Chapelle next to Katharina Fritz and so on, R which bring me to the, 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 the first image we see here, uh, is the Warhol egg painting? Can we go back, uh, Chloe? Yeah, let's let's just go through the the selected images that we have here to share with our friend. How did this come about? Uh, this is in Cologne. This is in Cologne, nineteen ninety seven, and it's come about. For, uh, I tell you the short story because that's most interesting for viewers. Yeah. So I went to uh, a city in France, uh, Nantes, that uh, was hosting a, a little the Kunstverein, how you call it, like little little Kunst uh, art place, was hosting mm -hmm. a small Sherry Levine exhibition. Uh huh. And I went for the opening because I, I, I have a, I'm a big fan of your work. So I went there for the opening. And on the way, I thought, why, why am I doing that? It's so far away. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's the only tiny show. Mm -hmm. At the dinner, I sat next to a uh, future president of Warhol Foundation. Ah. And I sit there and I... And he said how much I like Warhol. And he said, why don't you do a show? And I said, how I can do it? I have no connection to the to the foundation, etc. And he said, just come by. 
and and he introduced me to Vincent Fremont. Uh huh. And 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 Vincent suggests that we do a show, and I thought the best to start will be to do the egg paintings, and that was it. Amazing. But uh, but I have to say that when I was starting, I was working with a great collector in Berlin, uh, Reinhard Onash, mm -hmm. who I did like kind of run his gallery for a year, and and he said, go to New York, try to get a Warhol show. So in the I was in November in New York and met Andy Warhol, and. Um, And we organized a show, and when the op the op opening was, I think, in February, and like a few days before the opening, Warhol died. So that was my first experience with Warhol. Wow. Yeah, that was 1988. That's that was, no, that was 1980, wait, 87. Warhol 87. died in 87. Yeah. yeah. The show and, was 88, right. Yeah, and my show with egg paintings was 97 or 98, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what about this landmark show of Mike Kelly? How how did it come about? Uh, that, that was for, uh, it was the, on the left side, you see a picture from a museum in Bonn. Yeah. So it was obsessed with the idea of, of Superman, uh, the comics, of course, Superman, and obsessed with the fact that every single drawing of a candle or of uh, Superman City uh, was different. Mm -hmm. so then he made a research, kind of absurdity research, that you need like how many thousand years to build all these houses. <laughs> but in the in the comics, so you you see here a kind of uh, laboratory where during the show, students will sit and make models out of styrofoam or some material from the comics of the of the buildings, which was absurd because the the finish of this project will be by year two thousand or no three thousand or something it was gone. And then later, uh, he told me that he would love to find somebody who will be able to make these big bottles uh, that are incorporated in the works. You don't see it on this slide. In this, you see it in the back and on the videos. Mm -hmm. yeah, they were biggest bottles blown by, by mouse uh, at the time. We found a guy who had a Guinness Book of Rec uh, Guinness uh, Book of Records for the biggest wine bottle, and he found the uh, people in Sazava in, in Czech Republic that were able to to make these bottles. So how this practically starts this project? But this goes back to the year two thousand, and the show was made. Uh, the show ran. I think it was 2007, so it needed seven years to to make this project. Amazing. Okay, uh, let's move ahead to a few works of Andrzej Sominski here. Well, and Andrzej Sominski, I met, you know, it's always important for me at least to have a like initial moment that you kind of, something kind of, comes together by itself. So I went to an exhibition in Dusseldorf, uh, uh, in the Kunsthalle Dusseldorf called Binational. It was early 90s. Yeah. And there was a work on the wall called 2X. And there were two stains on the wall with two yellow stains. Yeah. And and I researched, and it turned out the guy is called Andras Slominski, and he just smashed two eggs on the wall and went went home. That was his participation in the show. Yeah. I find it very radical, but at the same time so visual. Mm -hmm. and, and and then I tried to find him. I, it was not so difficult. And and then he proposed a show with traps, animal traps. So the show was full of animal traps, and we had to put a sign that if you come with child, you have to be, you have to hold that child on the hand because the traps were set 
to catch. And there were some bear traps, so you could, a child could easily be uh, wounded. Yeah. She was wounded. So it was the only show that I had that I, that I had to put signs, you know, careful, there's art here that could be. And this particular work, X, is kind of very interesting because Andreas went to Mauthausen, which is outside of Weimar. He was invited to a show in Weimar. And yeah. outside of Weimar is this concentration camp. And he went in and was researching and found a little piece of money, a coin, from the Nazi times. So was kind of excavated by uh, the, uh, how you call the animal that runs under the earth and comes and makes a little, I don't know the name of the animal. Uh, so was the, the, the coin was excavated by a small animal and put back on the surface. So he, he collected that. And mm -hmm. at the same time, he thought, how I can represent this disaster? And he thought about wind. And then he made these works uh, with windmills. Yeah. And that is kind of uh, how you make a chair to a windmill. So that has this idea of uh, transition here. Yeah, it's super true. I, I, whatever that, you know, inspire him to this kind of conceptually interrelated works, it have its own performative action too. Um, definitely. Well, and, art, is know, a, no one... art is, is a trap, isn't it? It's a it trap. is a trap. Great yeah. art is a trap. It has to, has to get you, has to get you. Yeah. Uh, to attract, it has to get you into dialogue with you. Yeah. Chloe, the next one, I think we have... Oh, we are coming to Warhol again. Yeah. Bloom March. So tell tell us more about these two paintings. Was it acquired at the same time? From the same public? time, and there are separate paintings. I love to keep them together. They always hang close together. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes out of 12 crosses, 24 crosses. But... Um, I love to, uh, you know, I, what's great about Warhol is so rare. The artists of such a career, such a popularity, yeah, such a, such a status as a, almost like a pop star. All his life, he still experimented. He still wanted to do, didn't do just produce works, but he was searching. All his new works were always. Uh, let's say kind of provocation or mm -hmm. uh, research uh, or search for, 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 for unknown yeah yeah ah here is a Chris Martin before yeah. I even know back it to the, back to the music <laughs> back to the music that's right because you will see um, records being glue in these black columns. And yeah. uh, this is, I yeah, think- there are some uh, records here you can see. Uh, yeah. I, never, I never show Chris, I never show Chris. We were sort of thinking of doing something in the chapel, which we didn't do yet. But I, I like his work, I like his work. And I love his work, believe it or not. That one right behind me, Raphael, can you see it? Yeah, it's Chris. Yeah, it's a Chris Martin. Hello. Yeah. Right here, uh, in typical. I see it. I saw it before. Yeah. Yeah, I have quite many, many of his work. Well, oh, wherever you are doing on the chapel, you should do it so I can go to the opening. Whenever ah, you so you are close friends with him. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, I let's move forward because there's a lot more we can talk about here. Dono, our belated friend here, um, passed away. That was, uh, that was a very spontaneous buy. Uh, uh, I thought this uh, because of my relation to American artists, I thought this would be a perfect picture for me. Uh, and as well, I, it's not an artist who I collected or who I uh, show in my gallery, but there are a lot of pictures in my uh, 
collection, they are not leftovers from my, my activities. Mm -hmm. They are bought later or bought from other colleagues. But this painting was, uh, I, uh, is in, in, you know, it's very, very big. It's almost six meters across. Yeah. But uh, it has some elements that makes me feel about uh, good about uh, our world. Well, you, it, yeah. Uh, our, our, our planet is mm -hmm. a very positive painting. Yes, it has It that. says even very domestic. You know? It says here on the left hand side. Anyway, yeah. oh, this, this is fantastic painting. Well, this, this is Eric Bischoff, uh, this, one this, of your... Lousy reproduction, but fantastic painting. Yeah, i seen it um, when it was shown in New York City. You say that Eric is a worthy successor of uh, Goya and Manet. Uh, and I, I kind of understand the relationship to the, the Goya dog subject matter. Um, here, of course, the depiction of the American suburbia, everything that go wrong in, in the decade of, of 1970s and 18 for sure. Um, but tell more about how you remark the color became the emotional urgency and how you talk about the use of white being as good as the way that money used white. Well, what I can say, there's nothing to say. You have to look at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, you know, it's this this experience of talking. You can still not convince anybody if you even talk. On the end, there's always question and what. Uh, yeah. And in this reproduction is very difficult. But I think it's what is great about Eric uh, is um, he can make the most boring surface attractive. He can make mm -hmm. something that is for, for somebody who says, oh, it's just a background. But it's, the background itself is already for me a, 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 a phenomenon. Yeah. And, uh, but, but because it's, it's you, you know, you can paint a woman in bed, it has been painted a million times. But yeah. the question is how it's painted. So we will have to, in this case of the, of this painting, we will have to be close up, see the brush stroke. He's uh, he's uh, in the the passion is in the in the in the detail. So the detail is uh, is I can say is the key. Yes, it's certainly revealed in how it's get painted the way. He does it specifically, personally. Can we see the next one, Chloe? Um, I think we have another one here. Yes, uh, another so, classic. So this I can say uh, something uh, like an anec more anecdotic because I was involved in the production. I mean, I didn't paint it, but uh, the story is like, uh, Krefeld is a place in Germany, a city in Germany. Mm. Where a villa, two villas, early villas by Miss van der Rohe were built in the late 20s. Yeah. And they are turned to, uh, they were given by the families uh, uh, to the Museum of Krefeld and now uh, exhibition spaces. And the uh, director of the museum asked me if I can ask Eric to do a shoulder. And since I knew the space for many years, I told Eric that this is a place where you cannot just make a choice of paintings and send over. You have to do something specific. And Eric asked me to hire or, or send him some images of actress and an actor. Mm -hmm. So we, we sort of hired this girl and this man uh, and Eric came over. We 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 furnished the entire villa. We, we got furniture. We made a bedroom, living room, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this couple was playing for Eric domestic scenes. So mm -hmm. he would say, "Okay, like in this painting, you are back from a party, and and the guy is 
you can see he passed out. He was drunk probably or whatever. You are back from the party and play now uh, the scene. Uh, you're getting ready to sleep or whatever. Or another scene, he will say, okay, you're now in the bathroom and uh, the, uh, you're getting ready to get out and he's on the phone or something like that. And then we place it. And then Eric photographed it and then went back to New York, painted mm -hmm. the paintings, and they were sent uh, to his, uh, I think two years later to Krefer to be shown. Amazing. Uh, what, a, what a beautiful story behind the painting, Raphael. And be, uh -huh. you know what? That was a rainy day. You see a light coming through, like uh, how you call them, the stripes on the wall. Yes, the, the uh, marquee or whatever. Yeah. Blinds, no? Yeah. yeah. So that was a rainy day. So we had a, the yeah. full uh, equipment, cinematic equipment to make it a daylight like a sun is getting up. Yeah. And here are, I believe that we have at least three images from of Francesco Clemente. Milty Jones, yes, sir. So this is a standard sort of portrait Francesco does of, of man. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I would say half is a portrait and torso and half are legs. It's majority of these paintings are built like that. Of course, you could imagine somebody cutting the left image Mm -hmm. and legs uh, as a separate painting uh, that's uh, maybe a suggestion that nobody should do but uh, I love that idea that the legs are sort of separate and the torso and the faces uh, in the other half yeah Francesco made quite a, a, a several portraits including Alba Clemente Frank Lebowitz and others on that very identical Extended horizontal format. Here is but a but in other paintings, you see that the guy is a dancer. It's, uh, I don't know the That's way. That's right. That's right. Yes. But here is a self portrait of Francesco looking uh, uh, at our planet. So I guess he's on the moon. Yeah. And that's the question uh, what the artist does on the moon? Uh, yeah. Without uh, oxygen. Maybe artists are always on the moon without oxygen. Well, I mean, but the vision is made. great. I like the vision. I, it's right behind you. Am I right? Those. Uh, it's it's one of it is there. Yeah, there are five of those. Yeah. Uh, I think one is if I turn the screen, is there. Is there. One, one of the things that I must say about Francesco, um, having just been in. Guggenheim will bow to see that huge commission, La Stanza della Madre, you know? I think it's 17 panel or canvas put together. He can do, he can undertake the biggest scale and the small intimate as the portrait there that we just saw on the screen. Uh, the most fluid. Was it in, in, uh, in Napoli, Napoli, no? Where is it? He's, no, he's here in New York. I saw him at the Francesco. No, 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 no the painting. The painting, no, the painting is in the Guggenheim Bilbao, the, the monumental commission for, I don't know, may have been in 95, 97. He worked on those paintings in two years. It's breathtaking. It's overwhelming. Anyway, let's continue with Katharina Fritz. Yeah. Uh, put the other image uh, next, uh, 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 maybe more. That was shown in Munich. Uh, that I like kind of because it's called Messekoya, which is uh, a, a, a fair box or, or, or booth for a fair with four yeah. figures, which are the figures are bishops. But what makes it uh, uh, incredible is why? why? I don't understand this word. Because basically you walk around, you see this, it's like everything, you have the feeling everything is inside, which you cannot see. And these four bishops are standing outside and, and protecting the inside that is not visible. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like, uh, so you can walk around it uh, 24 hours and you will still not come to a conclusion where the work is. It's like a, a, a trick. Yeah. But it's, uh, I, I like the sculpture. 
Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's, but the question is why why fair booth as a, a suggesting that could be shown in the in the art fair maybe I don't know. Right. Well, I'm glad you have those two pieces. You have more. Uh, and now moving on to Michael Heiser. Uh, wh how, what drove your attraction to Michael Heiser's work, Raphael? I, I went once to the, see the uh, double negative. I think it's so radical and so un-European, as very American. Yeah. I, I cannot... Think about one guy in 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 other country that could do this kind of work, just blow up a part of landscape to make this line. That's uh, that's uh, probably as radical as cubism, so as Picasso's. It's it's breathtaking. Mm -hmm. It's uh, that's a painting that he did in the seventies, but but really really the the work. Yeah. His key work is the double negative, is and it's of course the city that is just uh, has been finished just uh, I think two years ago. That's right. In it the valley, in the years. desert. Yeah, fifty if years. Later, yeah, uh, he called it what I can't remember how he said. If you want to see the pyramid, you go to Egypt. You want to see my city. You go to Nevada. <laughs> this is my blood, he say. Fifty yeah, years in the making. Yeah. Fifty years and, and by itself, yeah. you know, in the yeah. you can imagine in the 60s, 70s, the first yeah. he when he was there, the first post office was one hour driving to Dirt Road. And when you drove this, you could see you could see wild horses. You could see uh, bird. I mean, for me, it was uh, fantastic to, to to go through America that is unknown to me. I didn't yeah. know that there are still wild horses jumping in there. Did you the... manage to meet him at all, Rafael? Yeah, I I went to Las Vegas in the early nineties, and he picked me up at the airport, and we drove to his place. In Nevada, so I stay over there at, uh, overnight or maybe two nights. I don't remember. And the, but the city was not as far as now, so that yeah. was he did a huge uh, addition to what I saw. Yeah, but I saw okay. yeah. Half well, let's see. If we can see the next one. That's um, is, yeah. That was related to objects that he did. To go back again, Chloe. Sorry. We we have uh, yeah yeah he did several objects I think it's related to excavations uh, or excavated objects in South on in Middle America that was from the time when he was traveling with his father in, yeah uh, in when well, his father was a, was an archaeologist and he yeah, just he, said, he just said well I didn't develop anything I just blow it up yeah yeah his father Robert Heiser is a very well known archaeologists right. so and, that's, he did, yeah. and he did several works that are related to these objects or prehistorical objects that's right yeah okay now we can move on to a few again related to from the very beginning your mike kelly um that's uh that's from the project he did called half a man where he uh exhibited several stuffed animals Important was that all the stuffed animals were used animals. He didn't buy new ones. What was mm -hmm. very important to him that they were used by children. They were had they had this <laughs> that they had this um, relation to childhood that was real. That the yeah. children will need them. That was just not. I, I love this work. I love this work. Why it's called Frankenstein, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it's maybe related to the American youthful rebellion, which is what we yeah. admire so much about his work. It's go and that's, again, that's again a picture from my gallery uh, when we showed 2007 in Berlin when I mentioned this production of uh, blown glass uh, vessels. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, the cities are within the... The uh, the bottles, yeah, and 
uh, on the very early stage, he was thinking of blowing the air through the cities, through the pedestals, so you could see the storm in the bottom. But yeah. then, then uh, that was too much of trouble, and he made them as a videos, which you can see on the wall. So yeah. on the wall will be projected uh, a storm in the bottom. Yeah. Uh, and... All right. So I, I, we can come back to Mike Kelly a little bit, but I guess we can now, um, I guess we have a few works here by Miguel Bichalo, Bichalo, who's Barcelo, uh, Barcelo, Miguel yeah. Barcelo. Yeah, and he'd be becoming more, I don't know how to describe it, but the last decade, Raphael, is it true to say that his ambition and his, the, the greater freedom in making works is far more, um, I would say, fluid than we ever seen him? I don't understand your question because, uh, uh, not acoustically, I don't understand. Oh, okay. You mean that, me... that he is better now than he was before? Yeah, I mean it's just that uh, we know we know. Remember, that... this is two thousand, so it's two twenty-two, uh, twenty-two years ago, twenty-four years ago. Twenty-four years ago. And if you so go, that... uh, and if you go back ten years earlier, I think Miguel. Yeah. You, you know, if you're a great artist, you don't start to be uh, with uh, being mediocre artists, and you develop to the to a better artist. I think uh, even in a, when you think about early Van Goghs, which are kind of difficult, but you can see the intensity. They are not as great yeah. as masterpieces he did uh, a few years before he died, but uh, but they they are promising. And and of course, there is early work of Mikhail. They are this more. Um, I would say maybe the very early, uh, you can see that it's not yet there. But I think in even in the early work, you see the that there is somebody coming in big time. You know. Yeah. And well, and Miguel's late work, uh, which is which he showed a few years ago, are still lives after. I, I think he was in. Uh, sort of having dialogue with Dutch paintings of the 17th century. Which yeah. he, or, but but to, looking at this multiplicatio, it's a ceramic that he did in relation to his project that was for the Cathedral in Palma de Mallorca. And he yeah. was by the bishop to make a, a, a chapel, to decorate the chapel of St. Saint, Saint Peter. And it was about multiplication of of uh, fish and and wine and love, and and this is just one of the smaller works. It's still two by three meters, but smaller works because the chapel is about, uh, I think, three hundred square meters. Yeah. Of ceramic. And this is uh, later. This is uh, uh, fantastic. But you know, you you have to know that he paints it like. Uh, Kind of, let's say he dives to see it. He doesn't make like reproduction of that. And he dives. He's yeah. uh, so the, even the early painting before that was from his direct experience underwater. Yeah. So it's it's uh, he knows what uh, that's his sort of what's what's let's say for uh, Cezanne uh, Montagne Saint Victoire is is for. Miguel Barcelo underwater world. That's a very nice way to put it, Raphael. It's super you true. Wherever the the material, he's I can you it. know I can hear this painting. I cannot when I first experienced this painting. I didn't I didn't only see it. I I hear the painting. I hear the the the, the tuna passing by. I, I kind of I never been diving, but that gives me an impression that. To to look at is also to hear it, you know. Uh, yeah. To, how interesting! Well, Miguel told me about his friend who is blind. Who yeah. Come see his paintings, and I see. So a blind person is also able to see painting. How this is possible? 
Well, you 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 certainly can touch it. Also, <laughs> his work yeah. is so few. I, 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 but there are yeah. other other experiences probably uh, that that we don't even imagine that I exist. Yeah, we don't experience. It. Well, uh, from Miguel to who's last time I saw who he, he was in Mali, we have a Zoom together. So he's gonna come on our NSEs, hopefully in the next show. But from from Miguel's incredible earth earthy materiality, now to Araki is the opposite. What is your obsession with Araki? May I ask, Raphael? Well, what so? Again, uh, uh, a story, okay? Okay. Uh, 1992, I was uh, visiting the Ludwig Museum in Cologne, and then I go, there's a little bookshop. I go to a bookshop, and I take, uh, there's a, on the counter, there's a book, a name, Araki, I never heard of it. And I open it, and there's a, a sentimental journey, a, a series of photographs, sentimental journey about his wife, her life, he, their life together and her death. And the last picture is when he holds her hand and photo, he, he's, he's just photographing all the time. So he was holding her hands and photographing the moment when her pose was zero. So the moment she died, that was his. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, he's, uh, I'm saying this because I was seeing this, then I was reading it. Uh, uh, there was a little text by Araki joining this series of photographs and I completely collapsed looking at it. So yeah. I, I, one week later I was in, in Tokyo. I flew right away to Tokyo and, and to a common friend I found his agent and we, uh, and that's how it came through, through a book that I by chance found in a bookshop. Yeah. Uh, and since then I collected his work in depth. I have, uh, uh, I mean, I don't, it's not important to know how many. It's important yeah. to know that I have to have many because he works in series. So like this series is about 80 photographs. The other, the other sentimental journey with his wife is 113 photographs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he's not working with a camera on the, on the tripod and making picture one picture a day, he makes yeah. hundreds, hundreds a day. So, and he's, uh, you know, he published about, I don't know, 700 books. Because Easily. He, ma, he believes more in the, the, the photographs are in context of other photographs, you know, that he takes. Yeah. So that's the beginning. Very true. So here we come to one of your most invested artists, Namely, Philip Taft. You're talking about my book. <laughs> yes. Well, I may as well mention that's how we met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, the book is here. And the book is here. Fantastic book. So tell us more about, about when you come to, into contact with come, Philip. Come back to another painting because it's an interesting story with it. Uh, so, uh, Philip is one of the artists, uh, maybe a little bit like uh, like Araki. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm still uh, in the museum, and I in uh, that's uh, mid eighties. I walk by a stand in Basel Art Fair, and there's a painting in the back, not a big painting. And I pointed out to the art dealer, I was a curator at the time, and asked who is this, and this was. This uh, the booth or this the dealer was Askan Krone from Hamburg, mm -hmm. and the painting was the early uh, early painting after Barnett Newman that um, Philip made for him. So uh, that was my first encounter with the work of uh, Philip. And when I moved to Berlin and for a year I worked for uh, the Reinhard Onash, uh, Lucia Amelio visited. Mm -hmm. And he encouraged me to come over to to Naples, which I did. And there was a show of Philip Ta. Uh, uh, and that painting was there and was, uh, I, I couldn't afford this painting. This painting I bought 10 years later. 
and and but that was uh, I met Philip through basically through a show like one painting and an the art fair mm -hmm. and then that's Lucio. Wow, that was uh, sort of his ex his uh, transformation of his experience of Vesuv mm -hmm. and his love for Clifford Steele. Yeah. And the With next one is Newman. You see Clifford still. Yeah. And yeah. that's, of course, his Barnett Newman uh, big uh, uh, painting that I first saw in the show called uh, Birth of the Cool, which mm -hmm. uh, did. And, and I always loved this painting and uh, I couldn't get it. And many, many years later, probably 20 years later, was offered to me. Oh, so, that's so, nice. I, so I was not. Uh, that's one of my like. Uh, this another one. Yeah. That that is uh, that is fantastic. You know, you go to the to the to the dump to to the place where people throw things away, and you 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 excavate it and you make a masterpiece out of it. You know. Mm -hmm. Make mm -hmm. something great of something that people don't want. You know? Yeah. So, and and on top of it, you have to imagine these are targets, and he makes out of it a, a holy painting. So it's uh, I love this painting, but there are many paintings of Philip that I I will say the same sentence. Well, not many artists who's given the beautiful publication as you did. Uh, which I review in the rail. Oh, here is uh, another great artist, Ronnie Horn. This is a picture from Castelli, Leo Castelli Gallery. And this piece was, uh, I think, just one piece shown at the show. And it's a quote from Simon Weil. It's called To See a Landscape as it is when I'm not there. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, makes, uh, but the interesting, to, now you see it. But when you enter from the other side, you see just stripes, blue stripes on the side. And then you have to go around yeah. to read it one way or another. But it's uh, beautiful uh, between, you know, the weight, the, the, it's a little bit, the, the landscape, which means gravity. Yeah. And, and art means elevation or, or so the, the transcendence here is kind of very pointed uh, between gravity and 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 uh, and uh, uh, resurrection or whatever I can say. My English is probably not good enough. Resurrection sounds good to me. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, okay, so now we come to at least four example of Ross Blackner. Yeah, they, uh, you know, uh, show the other ones quickly. Okay, so yeah. this is, uh, will you ask me why I like Ross, what's this? There's always the feeling that there's something behind. There's this, uh, not behind the canvas, in the canvas, something behind is like, Something is hidden. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot is here, but it's it's something like a like a secret behind. Yeah, I love this particular painting because I think that these are it's colibris, but I think there are this all his friends that die, all his friends that are not there anymore. They they dare uh, they they here for a moment yeah. and it's a homage to whoever is gone maybe you know maybe it's a homage to all the great artists that are not there anymore also the paintings are there but yeah. there's there's in the other painting with the stripes you have the feeling of a cutting but at the same time there's a uh, there's uh, a place behind yeah yeah i remember uh, his retrospective of the guggenheim in 94, 95, and I remember 
it brought tears to my eyes, you know, because you felt that sense of loss as you described. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's how you should experience art. That is not just talking, it's just seeing. And then 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 don't speak too much. Just just because that's language that we cannot I know. Uh, well, let's not... talk a few more minutes and we open up for questions, <laughs> right, Raphael? All right. So let's next few uh I think we have four works of Sarah Levine. You say from the beginning you went to a small town uh, as a small show of Sherry, and that's the first time you were exposed to her work. Was it? No, that was not the first time, but was the first time that I had a chance to uh, develop my relation to uh, Warhol Foundation. Right. Uh, Sherry yeah. Levine was... Uh, uh, I saw her work at Baskerville at Watson, or the watercolors, you know, the first yeah. time. And I, of course, I like it a lot. And there are different, uh, you know, she's a very unique artist. And I was thinking about, uh, you know, like the, the newborn. Mm -hmm. uh, why, is, why is so new? How I can explain this is new and et cetera. She's just using the newborn as the picture before. Um, uh, she's, she's using the newborn of Brancusi from uh, Philadelphia Museum, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and she's. Uh, you have to go back. Uh, the, 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 one one back. One one, back. Yeah. yeah, this is the newborn after Brancusi, and and she's just taking the original Brancusi and casting in white glass. So uh, once one sentence that I can say is: it doesn't matter in in art. Maybe it's a little vague, but it doesn't matter. The more important is not what you do, but how you do. So uh, the the in that in this case, I I I think about which is a little far, but uh, Jasper Jones took American flag, an image that existed, and painted a great painting. Mm -hmm. She's taking also a great image that exists. Uh, um, and uh, and that's a new one by Bancuzzi, in plastic in 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 glass. But mm -hmm. the, the, there is more to the story because she found an image that this uh, Brancusi was placed on the grand piano, and uh, and she installed it this way in in Philadelphia. She took six grand pianos and put on each one one uh, head. Yeah, this is how it was shown at uh, 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 at. Originally, what was the collection? Uh, the the Arons Arenberg collection. Yeah, Arenberg had it on a, on a grand piano. Right. So there is a lot of to talk about, but but it's still why why is why this piece is great? Well, you have to see it and and you have experience it, and then you you and yeah. and, and and not be blinded by price or by uh, critics. What you have to experience this yourself. Well, I mean, everything Sherry's been making, it's never failed to have this um, direct transparency, you know, to to her own, I would say, gesture of admiration and a sense of solidarity with the subject rather than being so anxious, being so critical on the issue of authorship. I think that's her great conceptual contribution. Um, yeah, this is the one that she collaborated with Bob Gober. Am I right on this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, amazing. For me, this is homage to Marcel Duchamp. Yeah, in a absolutely. Way. Yep, as a new gesture. And now we are coming, I believe this is coming to the, the very end. Uh, we selected, I can't remember, maybe four pictures yeah. of Terry. Yeah, that's an early one, early one. Uh, super Luma. early, yeah. And this uh, is, yeah, I showed this one in Berlin. A portrait. Mm -hmm. we have you see, four. this is, uh, you know, for him it's a portrait. Mm-hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's... Uh, you you just you just follow your 
interest, what your interest, he is obviously interested in science. One day uh, in the 80s, I saw him talking to uh, Atom uh, in, in Geneva with a guy who was uh, uh, a phys physical science. Yeah. And obviously, this is this is what interests in. By the way, this reproduction is beautiful. It's very good. Yeah. And this absolutely. is this is what he's obsessed by. That's you have to be. You have to search there where, where your interest is. You have to dig where you where you feel your life is there. You know. That's again. Uh, Again, uh, I was thinking of Cezanne sitting in front of uh, of uh, still lifes and making it again and again. So maybe this physical world is for 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 Terry. What's Apple was for Cezanne. We don't know. This is installation from my place where, where in my back here. This is installations in my uh, sort of. Uh, living room. Uh, it's not a place where I live, but it's, I live close to here and I make some rooms where I, my collection is uh, for me and, on, and friends who come over and, and can visit me, you know. So it's you perfect. It's what a place. Uh, what a pleasure, Raphael. Uh, as I would end this before we open up for our friend to ask questions. I remember go, go, go in, one more image to show the chapel. Yes, I think. Oh, yeah, we should not forget how to maybe. I think we have a few more of the chapel there at the tail end. Yes. Yeah, there's the chapel. This yeah. is this is important because I know the, the, the best go because this is outside. The outside, this is the key. This yeah. is the key. Chapel is beautiful when you're inside. You see, so. Uh, it's big. It's uh, you know this is you don't see it the size and the feeling of it, but the chapel is fantastic. So I know you have shown Terry's work, Philip's work, and then potentially maybe even Chris Martin. Is it still operating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we have to find funds to ship this work because it's big. I mean, it has to be got uh, it. Um, but it's still in my head. In I mean. Right now, I see a painting in front of me. So it's still in my head and in my eyes. Yeah, and how often do you? Uh, the problem is, that, uh, I, I change uh, the schedule, and we're doing basically one show a year. You know, so I see. Yeah, but but, but uh, definitely, uh, Chris is one of the on on my waiting list. Okay, well, that's good. I will definitely fly there for the opening. Um. Well, Raphael, listen, it's a, a, been a pleasure. Uh, again, I love to to open up to our friend who can ask questions, but I would say what Khan Weiler once said uh, in that aesthetic confession. He said, to be an intermediary between the artists and the public, to clear out their way and to spare them financial anxieties if the profession of art dealer has any moral justification it can only be that it can it can only be that so i think you have been doing this steadily talking about our conversation there is a great quote by uh, dave hickey okay says yes. we we always you have to be you have to understand that we only talking in the presence of art. Talking about the art is, is only talking in the presence of art. You have to be, you know, it's not, art has its own language. So we're always circling around. But if we know it, maybe we are more attentive to what we say. Yes. We are only Absolutely. talking around it. It's like talking about music. What we can say about music if we don't listen? It. Yeah. But we try, of course. We try because that's our our hammer. Our hammer is our mouth, you know. So it's our how we say pool. Mm -hmm. 
so to communicate to each other like yeah, me and you yeah well that's what we just to show pictures <laughs> yeah um well thank you rafael let's see if we can uh, uh open up for, yes, uh, for our friend to ask some questions back to you right now chloe thank you fong and thank you rafael um, we have a question from GE. Um, I'll give GE a chance to unmute. And if anybody else in the audience has questions, please raise your hand or post them in the chat and I'll turn to you next. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Fong. And thank you, Raphael. Um, do you believe, Raphael, your strength of continuity and longevity has been really not in following a particular philosophy per se, but instead simply looking for the timeless quality of works This is question. Yes. Can you repeat it? Because oh, I surely. Yes. Do you think your strength um, uh, of True continuity strength. and longevity? Pardon? Oh, True do you strength. think your strength of continuity and longevity um, has been not in following a particular philosophy, but more instead of simply looking for timeless qualities and work? Well. Uh... Uh, philosophy is I studied a little bit but it's not uh, what I use when I look artwork so uh, when you look artwork you try to uh, get this I mean can, you get it only when you get this moment so in the, in the, in the, in the other sense you cannot get artwork or dialogue with artwork every day. You can you, you can sit in front of it, but you still don't get anything out of it. It's like I believe that it's like, and if you're a poet, you better have a cut, a cut, because when you don't know what to write, you just you can have the cut in front of uh, or next to you, and you can, you can hike him. Uh, uh, how you say the uh, pet him and and you can think about other things but it, the same with it's not you don't get it by order you just have to be inspired it's like so making art is inspiration by also looking at art and giving to other people is also an inspiration i don't know if i answer your question but there's no oh, that, that, that gets that I, it really well. Yes, thank I have not ready to go philosophy to 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 use it as a key to every work that I can open up or, or close it or put away. Mm -hmm. Thank you, GE, um, and thank you so much for that answer, Raphael. Um, our next question is going to be from Raymond Foy. Raymond, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Hello, Raphael. I mean, my dear, dearest friend. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Fong. A <laughs> um, lot of books behind that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, they're waiting to be read. Um, <laughs> Raphael, I kind of have two questions. One is, um, uh, Cologne was a really important city in the art world when you first had your gallery there. And I wonder if you could give us a little description of what it was like being in Cologne, what the art world was like there. Uh, maybe how has it changed today? And... The other question I had was, when American art was such a dominant force, how did it feel to you being somewhat of an outsider? Was it oppressive? Was it interesting, exciting? Uh, so those are my two questions, Cologne and... Um, how I experienced New York, I mean. Yeah, yes. Well, uh, let's start with the second. Uh, no, I, I find it extremely... Uh, communicative and friendly American way of communicating. I, I find it uh, very professional. And and uh, first, you know, I went to New York when I was curator for Ludwig Museum. And I went to the Castelli Gallery. And I realized that's kind of interesting in, in towards today. Castelli was sitting behind the glass and, <laughs> and two people were sitting or three people uh, taking care of the artists. And, and he had a, quite a nice number of great artists. 
and he will come out. Uh, I said, I'm from Ludwig Museum. He will come out. And next day I was in just a job studio. So that was extremely uh, professional and open um, until today, I think so. So, but the other thing was I was in Cologne and I had, uh, I just finished uh, uh, curating the Europe America show for Ludwig Museum and decided to open a gallery and, and kind of naturally uh, my uh, my uh, focus was what's going on in America, curiosity probably. Otherwise, uh, how I will uh, curiosity, uh, you know. To, 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 I, I I till today I think you know when you think about beginning of the last century, uh, what was the greatest art coming from France? So even the German expressionist, which was good was never as great as French paintings. And, and I had the feeling that the early 80s, whoever one was in Cologne wanted to go to New York to experience what is really going on. And so I was one of these guys. And in New York, there were the heroes. There, were, there was Carl Andre, there was Soloit, there was Judd in, in his uh, loft. Then there were the younger artists, uh, interesting enough, you know, I'm, I'm first time I saw Eric Fischer work was in Jasper John's studio, 1986. Mm. Jasper was painting the Four Seasons, and there was a big drawing, which is now exhibited, by the way, in Basel, uh, Jasper John's collection. And I asked Jasper, "What is this?" And he said, "Oh, it's a young painter from." Uh, uh, from um, Soho, whatever, where he was living. And what, what, remind me, uh, uh, Raymond, again, uh, specifically, what was what, how was Cologne at the time, was your question, in the 80s? That was your question. How I, you, you, I experienced this very, very naturally because I'm sort of, I was not having any money and I was not interested in, in uh, dealing with art. So I could go to see uh, any artist, younger artists, mostly my generation. So we were kind of close. There was uh, to my home in Dusseldorf, there was a street called Hildebrandstrasse, where artists like Thomas Schütter, Reinhard Mucha was. So that yeah. were my sort of buddies. And then in Cologne, there was Kitz, uh, Hubert Kitzel, uh, minimal uh, younger sculpture. There was Günther Ferg, uh, Kittenberger, of course. And, 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 but there was, I will say more, before I was Adi, there was more like a, a nightlife or parties, et cetera. You know, it was young people life. It's uh, not, uh, of course, we saw shows of Walter Dahn and, and, and um, Paul Menz was kind of important. And of course, we went to Konrad Fischer Gallery. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the Konrad Fischer Gallery, let's say Bruce Naumann was there uh, sitting at the, at the uh, desk. Konrad was there. Konrad's mm -hmm. secretary, Dorothe uh, Gundula, was there. And the visit, the the, the whole uh, visitors at the opening were ten artists, and that's it. And Conrad will invite everybody for a beer, and 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 the food everybody pay himself. And so it was a completely different world. Only forty years ago, it was a completely different world. Rudolf Rudolf Swerner, David Swerner's oh. father had a also. He had, a, he had a sort of big galleries. He was uh, he was the sort of yeah the older guy. But uh, you know you know Raphael, I I wanted to add what what you just say in the first question. Um, I remember asking the same question when I saw a a, a, a show of Bruce Nauman at the Ocastelli. Exactly what how you describe it? I asked him very politely how he could sell the works. And his response, well, he came out, greeted me, and he said, I don't sell this work. 
<laughs> and so I say, so how do you manage to show it? And he say, well, what I show, what how I sell the works, mostly Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, James Rosen Quitz, Roy Lichtenstein. Right. So Baptiste I can afford, Bob. exactly, I can afford to support Bruce Nauman, Richard Serra, and he named one or other, can't remember the name now, but the two prominent ones that he sent money, paid for their rent, some money to live, certainly money to buy materials for well, decades. Back Dec to Raymond's question is, uh, you know, the important gallery was uh, uh, Max Hetzler, for example, where we, okay. where we went for every opening, where Kippenberger show or, or Werner Büttner show, or we went to Monika Sprut gallery. That was before I opened the gallery. Monika Sprut was showing uh, Cindy work. or So uh, there, there was a great atmosphere and uh, was like pre sort of pre-commercial time, you could say that, you know, it was... Of course, uh, everything costs money, but uh, uh, talking about the, the Bruce Nauman, you know, in the 150 years ago, uh, 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 Van Gogh writes to his brother a letter saying, I mean, this is five years before he died or whatever, uh, his dream will be to have enough money to pay a room, decent room, so it means have a bed and and enough money to eat once a day and have enough uh, uh, money for for paint. That is, uh, uh, you know, it's it doesn't doesn't say that art when it's very commercial is bad. But it doesn't say the opposite either, you know. So there, there is a, it, it's a time frame that uh, um, uh, has to be uh, accepted uh, individually for every artist individual. Yeah. Thank you, Ray, <laughs> for that incredibly generative question. Um, and I think if we have no more questions, the last question today is going to be from Babs. Babs, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Um, okay, hi, thank you again for this wonderful conversation. Um, I just was wondering, uh, do you maintain lifetime uh, long relationships with the artists that you show and collect? And um, you talked a lot about the collaboration what is the difference between that when an artist is making a work and then the works that they're making that involve the collaboration? And how exactly does that work with you and the artist? If you could talk a little bit about that collaboration. But first of all, if the, they're still alive, you know, then I keep contact with them. But my Kelly is not alive. Uh, the collaboration, uh, I don't know how I describe it for myself. Uh, uh, a great collaboration, if I may be more general, uh, is what Heine Friedrich did with Earth Room or Broken Kilometer or, or Lightning Feet. That's a great collaboration with somebody who gives the, 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 the financial possibility to an artist that he believes in to make a work that is in parentheses or, or, or uh, overwhelming for an artist's pocket and make it possible. Um, for myself, uh, I will not, uh, first of all, I never had enough funds to make a lighting field, but I would just, uh, it were like in my Kelly's case, we just produced these glasses and he just told me where to go who to contact and uh, how, uh, you know, what he wants to get out of it. You know, he will send sketches, et cetera. So, uh, uh, but uh, another collaboration, which I mentioned before was more ideal than financial was with Eric Fischel, the show in Treffert where we collaborated in the sense that I get, got the furniture, they got the actors, the idea that I, because I knew the situation that I told him, 
I don't get a work from the studio, just a choice, but makes work specific, uh, which, for example, uh, other artists like Daniel Buren did for the space or Michael Asher did for the space. And so that's, what, but but from, from, uh, from Eric's point of view was even, I think more uh, of an effort because he was not an installation artist, he was a, painter so the idea was even more uh, far out mm -hmm. and then the other thing that didn't come to a conclusion i i offer uh, 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 philip taft to make three paintings with uh, uh abrahamic uh, issues uh, uh, themes three paintings for my chapel which are uh, Let's say in progress, question mark. <laughs> thank you, Raphael. And thank you so much, Babs, for that question. Thank you so, so much for today. Um, thank you, Fong and Raphael, for this conversation. And thank you to all of you for those really wonderful questions. Um, I also would like to thank um, a few people who were really helpful in preparing for today's event, Lena Warcher, as well as my colleague at the Rail, Cal McKeever. Um, and I'd like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making daily conversations like this one possible, and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rail's YouTube channel. The Rail has been free and independent for 23 years, and a donation directly supports our writers, our staff, and our operations. You can support our work through the link that I'll put in the chat shortly. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with artist Clarity Haynes and Ksenia M. Sobaliva on the occasion of Portals at New Discretions Gallery. And as is real tradition, you all can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Great thank conversation. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Raphael. Thank yes, you. thank you. So much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, fascinating to hear your journey with artists. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Raphael. Thank what you do you so think much. of digital? <laughs> <laughs> I will fly there to see the chapel and the yeah, chapel. come over. Come on. I can't wait. Yeah. Right. So here everybody. We continue. Oh.